Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight's topic is so you want to breed your mare. Uh, breeding a mare is exciting. Who doesn't love a healthy little foal? But breeding isn't without challenges. There's choosing the right stallion, your mare's fertility, the stallion's fertility, uh, potential diseases, and the veterinary care uh, all come up. So to help you out, we are joined by two equine reproductive specialist, Dr. Ryan Ferris of Colorado State University, and Dr. David Schofield of Select Breeder Services. Welcome, Dr. Ferris and Dr. Schofield. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, happy to be here tonight, and, and hopefully we can answer a lot of your questions. Yeah. Likewise, Michelle. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ferris, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your role at CSU and your experience with mare fertility? I know CSU is well known for uh, their reproductive research. Sure. So I, I have three main roles in, in my, my, my duties at, at CSU. So I work in the, the clinical program, breeding mares to carry their own pregnancy, bowling out mares, working with problem mares, and in the embryo transfer program. Uh, my research uh, area of interest is really in infectious endometritis, specifically in biofilms, and, and trying to understand how biofilms may involve in chronic uterine infections and, and the best treatments for these, these types of infections and then do um, and involved in a lot of uh, teaching and, and continuing education courses for both horse owners and veterinarians uh, interested in and in learning new skills in the breeding industry. And Dr. Ferris, you mentioned biofilms and I've seen you speak on that um, several times at different conferences and it's kind of a big area of growing research, uh, but our audience might not be uh, familiar with biofilms. Can you explain a little bit what about what those are and why they're important um, to uh, mare owners, and I know that you can talk on the topic for hours, so we'll sum it down into a little nugget. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Um, so biofilm is just a, a state that bacteria can live in, and, and this state allows these bacteria to be tolerant to a lot of our, our uterine therapy, specifically antibiotics. And so um, it, it's starting to become of, of great interest and, and seems to be shown to be present in mares with chronic repeated uterine infections. And so a lot of our research is trying to characterize these, these type of biofilm infections, um, trying to identify the best ways to diagnose them, and then coming up with the best way to, to treat those. And so um, I think we're, we're getting close to, to having all of our questions answered. And, and um, if you're talking to your veterinarian, I think there's a lot of information now out there about biofilms and some great treatments for chronic uterine infections. Okay, and, and some help for those mayors. Um, Dr. Schofield, can you tell us a little bit about uh, SBS and your experience helping get people's mayors in full? Sure. Um, obviously, we're a little bit um, more on the clinical and uh, private practice side of the, uh, of the, of the practice echelon. Uh, Select Reader Services is a company that has uh, two offices in Maryland and Texas and then a, a whole host of affiliate laboratories or uh, more like franchises that use our our products and our procedures and subscribe to our quality control uh, processes for freezing equine semen. Um, we have labs scattered around the United States as well as in Europe, Australia, the Middle East, and South America. Um, in our home office in Maryland, which is where I work, um, we not only deal with all aspects of stallion reproduction, but we have a, uh, a mare services division where we deal with problem mares, uh, embryo transfer, oocyte aspirations, and the whole host of breeding problem mares. So we have a pretty, um, pretty, pretty busy breeding season coming up. And uh, one last piece of, that we try to do is um, act as a liaison between kind of clinical research that, that uh, office like Dr. Ferris do um, and try to act as a, uh, as a conduit to get that out into the uh, public domain and, and uh, make those advances available to breeders um, around the country. Okay. So for our audience, we have two great experts here ready to answer your questions. So go ahead and if you have questions that you want to ask of them, enter it in the console if you're listening on your computer uh, and we will try our best to get to those questions during the live event. I want to give you a quick review of how our Ask the Horse Lives go. We'll be starting with the questions that everyone submitted during registration just to get the ball rolling. Um, 
if you have those questions, like I said, go ahead and, and put them in the console in front of you in your web browser, or also if you would like clarification for anything the doctors have shared, go ahead and, and ask those questions as well. We're going to do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Ferris, the first question is for you, and it's from Shannon in Ontario, Canada, and she said that her mare doesn't display any typical signs of heat. What does this uh, does this mean that she's likely um, to be difficult to breed? I've, I've had a mare like this. So, Dr. Ferris, I'm curious uh, what your response is. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, and I'd say it, most likely this mare will still be relatively easy to get in, in the foal. Um, it just may be a little bit a little bit more difficult to know exactly when she's ready to breed because she doesn't show the classic signs of, of estrus behavior. And so... Um, oftentimes we talk about these mares having silent heats and, and I find it to be more common in, in maiden mares or mares with foals at side that don't seem to show the normal signs of, of estrus. And I think, think with this, a lot of times in our maiden mares, um, a lot of them are, are ex-performance mares and so they may not have been exposed to a stallion uh, previously in their life and so they just don't show a lot of estrus behavior or are very subtle in their signs. So I think for these type of mares, if you work with your veterinarian, they can use ultrasound to figure out where your mare is in her cycle and the best time to actually manage and breed her. Um, she may be a mare that artificial insemination uh, may be a little easier to perform um, because we can use ultrasound to detect when she's in heat. And even though she may not be showing signs of heat to a stallion and wouldn't stand to be covered by him, we can get her artificially inseminated and still get her pregnant and have a very good chance of getting her in full. So, Dr. Ferris, like I mentioned, I had a mare like this, and she, um, we did a live cover breeding on her, and it was difficult. And then the next time we bred her, we took her to uh, a facility, a breeding facility, where they had multiple stallions that they could tease with and, and very knowledgeable people and a vet on site. Um, is that a good option for people who are struggling to get their, their mares, who are a little bit quieter when they're in heat, and get them in full? You know, I think so. I think, you know, having that that multiple combinations there that you talked about, very experienced people and, and people who are, are experienced being around these mares and will just give her the little extra time that she needs to feel comfortable in the breeding shed for either a live cover situation um, or potentially it may be elected that, you know, the best situation for this, for this particular mare for the stallion safety and for your mare's safety might be to collect the stallion and perform an artificial insemination. So I think working at a with an experienced breeding facility uh, with a veterinarian there who can, can help ultrasound the mare and confirm that yes, she actually is ready to breed today is a great, uh, is a great idea. Dr. Schofield, we have a question already from our live audience for you and it's from Kelsey and she said that her vet has recommended that she put her mare under lights and use hormones uh, to get her ready to breed in May. She said she's generally interested in learning more about those hormones. How can they be applied and how may they have side effects? So can you explain to us a little bit about why we would use lights for a mare to get her ready to breed and then talk about some of the other things we can do to, to get her ready to be covered. Sure, it's a very timely question um, and, a, and a fact of the matter is that uh, most breeders are, are struggling with those, those decisions as we speak. Um, mares are uh, by definition a seasonally polyesterous animal which means that they are um, in, they are only receptive for mating during a season and they're polyesterous or go through many cycles until they're either uh, become pregnant or the season ends. Uh, mares are what we consider long day breeders, which means as daylight increases, their uh, GnRH pulses from their pituitary increase that slowly bring them into seasons. So as a, uh, as a mare comes out of the winter into the spring, uh, daylight is increasing, her pituitary starts increasing its uh, pulsatility of GnRH, um, in, the, in the fact that it's having a decreased expression for melatonin, and they will eventually start to show signs of estrus and go through cyclicity. Now, this happens at different rates and at different times throughout the year, or throughout the, the early breeding season, I should say. You know, mares in Florida might not have the same um, shutdown that mares in Maine might have. So different breeders have different uh, requirements when it comes to putting mares under lights. Generally speaking, mares need 45 to 60 days of supplemental light therapy before they will come out of a deep winter anestrus. So in our hands, uh, if you want to be breeding in 
in February, you're putting your marriage under lights in early December. Now that seems a little early for some people, which is is true. Um, but for the for breeders that are looking for animals to compete in aged events, they're looking for um, babies to be, be to be born earlier in the breeding season. Uh, typically in our hands, I'm not looking to breed that early, so I don't start putting my mares under lights until January um, to get kind of after the, I guess, the holiday hustle bustle, um, and it gives it a little bit easier task on the staff. So in our hands, uh, mares are brought in in January, they're put in stall, and mares need 16 hours of continuous light um, to be able to stimulate their pituitary to start the pattern of cyclicity. Um, that can be achieved by either, um, easiest way is usually by adding light at the end of the day. So we turn our lights on um, at the end of the day, starting at about 4 o'clock, and they go until 10 o'clock, and they shut off um, on timers, giving mares the, the, the extra hours of light they need. Um, hormonally, there are protocols out there, none that are 100% effective. I think the reproductive community will agree that that using lights is the most consistent and the most effective way of, of stimulating the marriage cycle early in the season. Historically, there have been hormone preparations out there, but they're not available anymore, um, so I can't really recommend them. So in my hands, until a marriage failed to cycle normally under supplemental light, I don't really go for extra hormonal protocols. Okay. So I'd like to Dr. follow Schofield. up on... Oh, yeah, Dr. Ferris. I was just going to ask Dr. Schofield, for those mares that have been under lights and, and for that full 60 days but just aren't cycling yet, do you reach for any hormones to help try to encourage them into cycling a little sooner? Yes, of course. There are um, preparations of low-dose GnRH agonists that um, can be given at frequent intervals during the day, depending on your, faci at your facility, uh, a deserelin acetate um, or a GnRH agonist of some kind, uh, most commonly deserelin in the United States, bucerelin in Europe. Um, are used at a very low concentration of 50, 25 to 50 micrograms multiple times a day to help stimulate um, the pituitary to release pulses of, of LH and FSH. That's affected in some mares, um, not 100% of the time. Other people will add in uh, dopamine antagonists like uh, uh, domperidone or sulpride, um, plus or minus priming with estrogens. And there's definitely different protocols out there. Um, in my hands, I think it's probably best to talk to the vets in your area because, like I said, people what people experience in Maine is very different than what people experience in Texas or Florida. So there is a little bit of nuance to handling these mares depending on where you are in the country. So before we move away from the, the light portion of uh, our discussion, we did get several questions about lights and people wanting to understand uh, that better. Uh, and Maybe Dr. Ferris, if you want to address this, uh, does it matter what kind of light is it? Like, are there protocols for light that's better, quality of light, amount of light, um, how that light should be introduced to the the horse? Is it in a stall? Is it outside? Uh, what what recommendations do you have, and what does the research say? Dr. Ferris, here I can start off, and then and maybe Dr. Schofield can add in. So for the the type of light, it doesn't really matter, and it's become a little confusing. Um, with all the different LEDs and halogens and fluorescent light bulbs that are out there. And the type of light doesn't seem to matter, and and, and even the color can be different. Um, uh, there's an Equilume mask that's now available, which uses a blue light in one, one eye of the horse to actually stimulate uh, enough light therapy to bring mares into cyclicity. So so even the color doesn't necessarily have to be the normal bright white light that we, we might expect in our homes. And so um, with that, the, the amount of light that you're looking for is 10 foot candles. And roughly for this, the question you know should be is, can you read a, a newspaper comfortably anywhere in the stall? So essentially anywhere that the mare could put their head, can you read a newspaper easily? And if so, you probably have enough light um, in that particular area. We use a, a wide variety of lighting type situations in, in our facility here at CSU from uh, keeping mares in stalls and so we, we lock them in their stalls at night so that way they're under the influence of lights and then um, a lot of our recipients are in outdoor paddocks and so um, they kind of look like miniature soccer fields um, and are, are lit up at night and so all of those can be can be very effective. Okay. Um. We have another question from our live audience, and I'm going to send this over to you, Dr. Schofield. It's from Melissa, and she said that she has a thoroughbred mare 
who's 13 years old and has never been bred, uh, how old is too old to breed a mare for the first time? Well, older mares present different challenges than younger mares. Um, and, you know, I, I, in my practice, I deal with a, a, a sizable number of uh, sport horses, uh, warm bloods mostly, that are, um, that are older. And they're usually maiden. They've had a long show career where they haven't necessarily had the time off to have a baby. So I routinely get 16, 17, and even 18, 19-year-old mares that are maiden mares. Now, um, it's not that those mares are infertile and they can't carry a baby, but they have special challenges that um, you need to be aware of going in. And, you know, obviously with any older animal, there are, um, there are metabolic concerns, musculoskeletal concerns, um, but the, the major reproductive concern for me is the health of the uterus and the health of the cervix. Um, one of those things is easy to determine. Um, by either by taking a uterine biopsy to make sure her uterus is, is healthy enough to uh, maintain a pregnancy through term. Um, but the other one is, is the cervix. And a, and a mare's cervix is a very dynamic organ. Um, in estrus, when they're in heat, it becomes very flat and soft um, and very, uh, I don't know, very, very soft and flat, allowing semen to, from the stallion to actually pass right into their uterus. During diastrus, when they're actually in out of heat or, or pregnant, their cervix tightens up and becomes very tight. Now, that process happens no matter what, you know, about every time the mare cycles. So if she is five years old, she's gone through five years of her cervical uh, changes. If she's 19 years old, she's gone through 19 years of that cervical change. So older maiden mares have a problem with having a stenotic cervix, which means their cervix is, is, is tightened down and, and has a very thin lumen, which is hard to get through. Now, in our hands with artificial insemination, we can get semen through their cervix. We can, we can either use our finger to help dilate it a little bit, or we can use small catheters to get the semen into their uterus. It's getting the normal post-mating inflammation that all mares undergo. Getting that fluid and that debris out of their uterus is the problem. So with a maiden older mare, we, we have to manage two things. One, getting semen in the, into their uterus, and two, getting semen out of their uterus. Now, you mentioned that she's a thoroughbred, so if she's going to be live covered, getting semen into her uterus when she becomes 14, 15, 16 years old can be problematic. So I would recommend um, that when she is in estrus, when she's in heat, to have your veterinarian feel, you know, sterile prepper perineum and go in and actually do a, a cervical exam and feel how tight her cervix is. Because if it's too tight and she's in estrus, there's a chance that semen might not even be able to get into her uterus where it needs to travel up to the uretubular junction to, to fertilize an oocyte. So my recommendation is wait for her to be in heat, have your veterinarian come out and check her cervix and make sure it, it lies flat and, and feels normal before you get too far down the process. But in my hands, we routinely breed mares late into their teens, early 20s without much of a problem. Okay. So we have a follow-up question from the live audience. Dr. Schofield is from uh, Greg in uh, South Australia, and he wants to know how old is too old to breed a mare, not necessarily a maiden, but just a, a brood mare. At, at what time is it best for her to maybe retire uh, from being bred? <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like a lot of times mares make that decision for you. I mean, Ryan might be able to chime in a little bit better on than, than or give you a better answer than to me, but, but mares would give that answer to you. I mean, they'll either not conceive or they will have a Slightly, they can have a, a tragic event. Mares that are older that have had many pregnancies tend to have issues um, either with uh, post falling off, post falling issues of, of uterine artery rupture that you might have in an older mare, um, and and just normal old horse problems that will limit their fertility. Um, I have bred mares into their 20s, but it does anything over 19, 20. You know, you have to be concerned. Uh, likewise, like I mentioned earlier, mares as they age, um, their endometrium goes through changes, and their endometrium isn't as uh, supportive of pregnancy as it may have been when she was five, six, or seven years old. So if her uterine biopsy grade, um, as graded by, under a Kenny Doig scale, gets to that 2B3 scale, you know, I'm reluctant to breed that mare because the outcome's probably going to be pretty poor for the owner. So you know, before I get too down the road of breeding a, a very old mare, I have that hard conversation with the owner um, to make sure that they understand the risks. We do a little bit of diagnostics to make sure that her uterus is capable of holding and maintaining that full of term. 
and then we um, proceed down the process, knowing that you know it may not work out. Okay. So I think the only uh, thing I might add, Dr. Schofield, is that you know I, I think for a lot of our mayors in, in the 20s, just like your practice as well, um, you know, and we'll have that conversation with the owner of that this mayor may no longer be able to carry a full to term reliably, but she might still continue to be a great embryo donor. And so embryo transfer yep. now may be yep. a great a great aspect to be able to continue her reproductive career um, for another three to five years. Okay. For sure. And so, so Dr. Ferris, that um, segues really nicely into our next live audience question, which is uh, from Kelsey. And she's interested in doing an embryo transfer, taking an embryo from a senior mayor and implanting it into a recipient mayor. Do you have any insight uh, on that process and what she should expect? Sure. So it's a it's a fascinating um, technology. It's one of the uh, one of the joys that I have of, of in our clinical program is doing embryo transfer. And so um, you're going to work with your your veterinarian, um, and so they're going to breed the mare just like you may have you've probably bred her in the past, and and she's had foals previously. And and so we're going to go through the same same situation. We're going to have um, uh, go ahead and get the mare inseminated or 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 covered. We're going to really need to know the day of ovulation, and the reason for this is that we're going to need to be able to recover that embryo from the mare's uterus, but more importantly, set up a surrogate for that embryo um, to be ready, so that way that the surrogate's ready to receive that embryo if it's recovered. So once the brooding process is done, um, seven to eight days after ovulation, we'll go ahead and try to perform an, an embryo recovery attempt, in which, if you haven't seen this before, it's, it looks kind of similar to to performing a uterine lavage. A catheter will be passed through the mare's cervix up into her uterus. We'll infuse media up into the mare's uterus, and, and this little embryo will, will float in that media, hopefully, pass out of the, the mare and pass into a filter, in which case your veterinarian will identify that embryo uh, under a microscope. The average embryo is about 400 microns in size, which if, if in your average newspaper or book is a, roughly the size of a period at the end of a sentence. And so they'll identify that embryo and then go ahead and get it, get it prepared to be transferred into the surrogate. Now, now in your area, you have a couple options um, for, for t potentially managing this mare. There's multiple centers around the United States that you could potentially send your mare where they could manage the mare on site and transfer the embryo directly into a recipient that lives on site. And, and both myself here at CSU and I know Dr. Schofield have, have centers that do that. Another option that, that a lot of owners um, are interested in is that they could keep their mare at home on their farm and work with their regular veterinarian, collect that embryo on farm, and then just have it shipped either uh, counter to counter or, or via airplane or via FedEx to a, to a center, a distant center, to be transferred into a recipient um, at that center. And then once that recipient is pregnant, she can travel back home um, and full out at your farm. That's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is it is pretty cool that that we can do these things, and so yeah. it it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to ship your mare a long distance away uh, any longer with the ability to ship embryos. We have another question on the senior, or older, or um, uh, problem mare uh, uh -huh. launch line. Uh, this is for Dr. Schofield. It's from Laura in New Jersey. She's listening there in our live audience. And she has a 23-year-old quarter horse mare with PPID that is in good body condition and is on pergolide. She's had three healthy foals in the past, uh, five or six years ago, um, but also has some uterine scarring. What are the chances of getting a viable embryo out of this mare with PPID? Well, PPID definitely in an uncontrolled state, so a mare that is that is not well managed or undiagnosed, so to speak, will have problems with um, with reproduction. Uh, we try to get our ma any mare that were questionable that may have some metabolic disease. So those are one of those things we try to look at early in the season and try to get regulated um, prior to getting into the meat of the breeding season. So, um, if the mare is on pergolide and well, with, you know, previously diagnosed with PPID, on pergolide and well controlled. Um, I don't have a problem breeding those mares and treating them relatively normally. Um, now, my bigger hiccup when she says there's some uterine scarring, you know, that to me is the bigger red flag than the PPID um, when it comes to trying to get the mare full. 
Um, we've had good luck with well-managed mares uh, that, that are um, stable in their therapy for, for TPID to get, to get pregnant and carry that full without a problem. Now, when it comes to the end of or later in term with mares with TTID, it should be noted that um, if, the, if that 23-year-old mare does become pregnant, she can maintain and be on her pergolide all the way up until that last, you know, depends on where you are. I usually recommend 45 days prior to her due date um, stopping the pergolide. Um, we need her mammary gland to be able to develop normally so that she can create not only colostrum but provide milk and nutrients for that baby. And the mare needs to be off pergolide for a, a certain amount of time um, before foaling. So um, my recommendation would be uh, to kind of get quantification on that uterine fibrosis that she mentioned. Um, make sure she's well controlled on TTID. And, and, and like I said, I don't have much of an issue breeding a mare that's well controlled. Just need to make sure we stay on top of that mare um, when it comes down to foaling. Um, Dr. Ferris, our next question is for you. It's from Leah in our live audience. And Leah says that her local vet doesn't breed using frozen semen, um, at least not very often. And it's a six-hour drive to the closest equine hospital. What questions should she be asking when looking for a local vet who might be willing to breed with frozen semen instead of cooled semen that she's used before? Or is there anything that she can do as the horse owner to make the entire process easier? Sure. So I think, you know, when you, you know, breeding with frozen semen just adds some extra challenges and, and it's going to depend a little bit on on how many doses of, of frozen semen are available to you. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you two scenarios here of, of using frozen semen and why some some veterinarians elect to, to breed with frozen semen and others go, boy, it's a lot of work. So for for a lot of our quarter horse type clients, um, oftentimes they're selling a pregnancy at that point. And so we oftentimes get two or three doses of frozen semen to use per cycle. And so we have a lot of semen that we can use and that allows us to breed the mare pre and post ovulation. And so as long as they're set up with breeding, most veterinarians who, who do a lot, of, a lot of breeding are set up very well to utilize uh, frozen semen in this situation and can be very successful. Now, where frozen semen becomes a little troubling, oftentimes a little more common in our warm blood uh, type mares, is that we only get allocated one dose of frozen semen per cycle, which means we need to breed within six hours of ovulation. So oftentimes this is where we're, we're checking these mares frequently, even through the middle of the night. Um, and so this becomes where it's, it can be quite difficult to breed mares with frozen semen. And so when thinking about this, uh, talking to your local vet, um, how many doses of frozen semen you have available, letting them know um, your particular situation and what you're trying to accomplish um, will be quite readily. And if you can find someone locally, and it is a six-hour trip to to a referral center, I think some, doing some things of, of getting your mare set up, either knowing where she is in her cycle, so that way when you do take her that six hours, she's actually in heat. Um, potentially, you could have her checked by your local veterinarian before going there, knowing she has as a, a growing follicle and that she's going to be ready to breed in a day or two so that way when you actually take her that for that six hour trip she's only going to be there for a few days before she could head back home. So Dr. Ferris you mentioned a really important distinction there between the uh, the selling of the pregnancy versus the selling of the straw of semen. So how can mare owners know which situation they're in when they're contracting with a stallion owner? And what information do, do they need to share with their vet about what they've purchased with their breeding? Absolutely. So, so usually it's uh, written into the contract pretty readily. And so um, for, for the vet, if you're buying a pregnancy, it, it usually uh, dictates that or lists that. And then it lets you know exactly um, how many doses of semen will be shipped at a time for use to get that mare pregnant and, and um, pretty clear versus buying doses of, so with that, you're, you're essentially able to order more frozen semen on an ad needed basis until your mare becomes pregnant versus if you're buying doses of semen, um, you may, you, you buy your dose of semen and it's, um, if your mare gets pregnant, fantastic. If she doesn't get pregnant, you're going to have to buy another dose of semen um, to breed her again. And so I think having that information is, is extremely helpful in advance um, and, and letting your veterinarian know exactly, you know, um, can we get more semen 
what's the situation? Is it um, we've bought this, these, this one dose of semen and we have this one chance? Or have we bought a pregnancy and we have multiple doses of semen uh, to get this mare pregnant? Because it's going to dictate how we manage those mares as well and, and, and the odds of getting her pregnant. Dr. Ferris, we have another question for you from our live audience. It's from Kate, and she wants to know what breeding method or ne next steps would you recommend for the confused owner whose mare has been bred several times with utmost care but still is not pregnant? Sure. So these can be frustrating for for all of us, and and I think when you know this time of year, we're all thinking about those mares that that we've tried diligently for the last year or two to get pregnant and so so oftentimes I I will go through the mare pretty critically um, evaluating her looking for for any uterine abnormalities um, specifically does she have evidence of of infections of, of accumulating fluid in her uterus following breeding um, uh, fibrosis in her endometrium as as Dr. Schofield talked about. So I think getting a good breeding soundness exam done in their mare um, may be very helpful in trying to figure out why she might not be getting pregnant. And so um, as part of that, um, some other important questions to have or, or some information to have for your veterinarian would be is, is how many stallions you've tried breeding this mare to. If you've been trying to only breed her to one specific stallion, um, we've seen in the past that there are certain times that it seems like there's a genetic incompatibility between a certain mare and a certain stallion. They both may be very fertile independently, but when combined, um, it seems like it's extremely difficult to generate a pregnancy from that combination. And if we just simply switch to a new stallion, that mare gets pregnant quite readily. So, so I think sitting down at this time, it's a great time of the year here as we're starting to just get into the start of the breeding season uh, to schedule an appointment with your veterinarian, get a full breeding soundness exam done on her, and really try to identify why she might not have been getting pregnant in the past and what we can do in the future to hopefully be able to obtain a pregnancy for her. Um, and we have a question that dovetails nicely into that from our live audience. Um, Bren is listening, and she wants to know why or she wants to know if her maiden mare, who's been bred twice to the same stallion without success, the first time she didn't take, the second time she did get pregnant but lost the pregnancy, she wants to know if it's possible that there, if there could be a genetic issue that's keeping that uh, mare and stallion from conceiving. Boy, and, and have, would be interested to hear Dr. Schofield's opinion on this. Usually when I've seen the genetic incompatibility, usually it's an issue of, of the mare ever really seeming to become pregnant initially. Um, you know, for, for a mare that you're describing like this, a maiden mare who uh, the average mare has about a 60% chance per get, getting pregnant on each individual cycle. So she took two cycles to get pregnant and unfortunately um, did not stay pregnant. You know, I'd, I'd probably go back to that stallion uh, one more time to see if we can get her pregnant and, and to carry a foal to term. Um, usually when we've seen the genetic incompatibilities, those are issues where we can never get a pregnancy or an embryo generated um, from that particular stallion um, at all. Dr. Schofield, do you have a, have you seen a difference in, yeah. in, in no, genetic I, compatibility I concur. there? I haven't. I, I concur 100% with what you're saying. I mean, typically when I, when I try to make that switch to a new stallion, I'm looking at a Marin stallion that are, that are normal to me. You know, a mare that has no diagnosed uh, uterine pathology or infectious causes, a normal cervix, and a stallion that I know is fertile, that's proven, that's that's breeding other mares and generating pregnancies. And when you've had, when you when you when you when you make sure that both the mare and the stallion are normal, um, and you've bred the mare, uh, you know, three, four, five cycles and not generated pregnancy, that's when I start looking at um, the other genetic causes. Um, I wouldn't be concerned about a, a maiden mare that that got pregnant on the second cycle and then happened to lose it. Um, that's well within the, the normal for me. I know I think Ryan hit it when, and I think it's a, a good point to hit home on that, that normal fertility in the mare is about 60% per cycle. So if you have 100 mares and 100 normal mares, you breed them one cycle, 60% are going to be pregnant, 60 of them are going to be pregnant, and 40 of them are going to be open. Those 40 are still normal mares. They're just not pregnant. If you breed them another cycle, then effectively 80 of that 100 are going to be pregnant with 20 normal mares still not pregnant. So, you know, that mare I wouldn't be concerned about going back to the same style. Right. And, and just one other clarification, I guess. 
when we talk about a genetic incompatibility, it's not a, a genetic disease the stallion has or the mare has. Um, this is a, a topic that comes up in um, uh, various aspects, and it seems like it's it's variability within the uh, MHC class antigens that all of our cells express that it's really an incompatibility at the cellular level. It's not a, a true genetic disease or anything like that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Schofield, we have a question from Emily in our live audience and she wants to know if you can explain the difference between cooled and frozen semen. She's curious about what the process is for insemination using each and the timing of insemination with cooled versus uh, frozen. Sure. So, um, in general, I mean, in generally speaking, um, cooled semen ha is semen that is collected from a stallion. It is then partitioned out into aliquots with an adequate number of, of, of totally modal or progressively modal sperm, and it's put in a, in a for better, a, a, for better terms, it's called an extender. But it's, it's effectively a, uh, a solution that contains um, buffers and nutrient source some antibiotics and, and proteins that help stabilize the, the cellular membranes of the sperm um, that help stabilize them during a cooling process. And when we talk about cooled semen, we're talking about cooling that the temperature of the, of the sperm sample in extender down to about 5 degrees centigrade, which is um, pretty cold but not freezing, and that slows the metabolism down of the sperm. And that is, that's the goal of that is to allow it to live longer. Um, it, it helps it decrease, by cooling it, you decrease the amount of reactive, reactive oxygen species that are produced, you slow the rate of metabolism so they should last longer, um, and provide uh, a, a, a nutrient support for them to have longer longevity. When we talk about cooled semen, that semen can be collected at our facility in Maryland on a Monday. It can be packaged in an equitainer or a, a, a box that keeps the the cooling rate down to 5 degrees C at a, at a prescribed level, and then once it gets to 5 degrees C, maintain it for a prolonged period of time. Um, that semen can be shipped to Colorado or Texas or California, arrive the next morning, and inseminated in the mare. So cool semen, by definition, is, is just that. It's, it's never actually frozen. It's just cooled to 5 degrees C and inseminated in the mare within 24 hours of collection whereas frozen semen goes through a little bit further processing. With cooled semen, we expect the, um, the semen sample that was collected at time zero to arrive to a facility at 24 hours to be inseminated in the mare and expect good fertility to last for another 24 to 36 hours after that mare has been inseminated. So if the mare hasn't ovulated when the semen gets there, say it's collected Monday, ship arrives Tuesday morning, the mare is inseminated Tuesday morning. If that mare ovulates Tuesday or Wednesday morning, then she's covered by that insemination of cooled semen. Okay, so we expect cooled semen longevity to be 24 hours to 48 hours after insemination. Now, frozen semen is a little bit more tricky. Frozen semen goes through further processing. The extenders initially are the same, um, but then we process the semen and and actually uh, uh, what's the uh, um, concentrate the, seam, the sperm rich fraction. So we're getting sperm into a pellet. And we're adding that into an extender that has uh, not only a nutrient source, but it's got um, some egg yolk and more importantly, cryoprotectants. And the cryoprotectants are designed to not only remove water from the cell, but also stabilize cell membranes as they are cooled and then eventually frozen into semen straws. So Semen or sperm membranes, just like any cell membrane, is a fluid, um, is a fluid, soft uh, membrane, and so it doesn't really like the idea of being frozen. So adding certain cryoprotectants helps stabilize the membrane and allows the cell to be frozen in liquid nitrogen and then eventually thawed and put into a mare to be bred. Now that further processing comes at a cost to longevity. So where we expect cooled semen, semen stored at five degrees centigrade to have a, a 24 to 36 hour uh, longevity after being inseminated, frozen semen's probably more like 12 hours. Some good frozen semen might last longer than that, but um, on average we usually say 12 hours. So what that means is that we need to breed a mare a little differently. In our, in our hands we try to um, use two doses of semen to put 
um, not only a pre-ovulatory dose in the mare, but also a post-ovulatory dose in the mare. So um, our window is six hours pre-ovulation, pre uh, sorry, excuse me, 12 hours pre-ovulation and six hours post-ovulation. As Dr. Ferris mentioned earlier, the oocyte or the egg is only good for six hours. So we try to sandwich that ovulation by putting frozen semen in her before she ovulates within 12 hours and then after she ovulates within six hours. So we're covering the ovulation from both sides. So the frozen semen, once it's frozen and it's in a straw and it's in a tank filled with light, liquid nitrogen, as long as it stays at that temperature and never warms up and never thaws, it's really good forever. So it can stay in liquid nitrogen to be used at a later date. We generate pregnancies pretty much every year from stallions that have been dead for 10, 15, and even 25 years. So the difference between cooled and frozen semen really is the processing and then how quick we have to use it. Cooled semen needs to be used, obviously bred the next day. Frozen semen can be left in a, uh, in a static state for many years and then just inseminated um, at the appropriate time. Dr. Um, Schofield, would you mind commenting on uh, pregnancy rates between cooled semen and frozen semen? Sure. Um, historically, I mean, if you, if you look at large data sets, I used to tell clients all the time that, you know, breeding mares with fresh semen on the farm has about a 65% per cycle conception rate. Cooled semen has a 55 to 60% per cycle conception rate, and frozen semen has a 45 to 55% per cycle conception rate. Obviously, you know, there are trade-offs. Um, I, in our hands, we have published large studies that show um, that show with proper management, you can achieve very adequate and very um, comparable pregnancy rates with frozen semen as you can get with cooled semen. Um, it's very stallion dependent. Stallions can be very great cooling semen producers and very poor freezing semen producers. So it's a very stallion dependent um, fact. But in general, um, pregnancy rates in, in any well-managed clinic with, with cooled semen should be in that 50 to 60% per cycle conception rate and with frozen semen should be 45 to 55. So that's what I kind of quote clients. Um, but again, it really comes down to the individual variability in, 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 a, in a stallion. One thing that you can definitely do to hamper your success is by um, using poorly processed semen. So semen that's processed poorly even for cooled semen can have poor fertility that's not handled correctly. Not only handled correctly on the receiving side, but handled incorrectly on the producing side. So things like bacterial contamination, poor collection technique, um, poor cooling, old old equitainer boxes, all of those things can decrease the, um, the pregnancy rates that people achieve. So um, in, in a well-managed program with people who know what they're doing and, and good quality semen, those are the numbers I usually quote people. So, Dr. Schofield, uh, as a mare owner, how do you know that you are getting quality semen and also that your vet on your side is handling it properly? I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's certainly a level of, of confidence. I mean, um, I think that um, it's very good to have your, have your mare owning clients know what, you're gonna look, what you look for and what you expect um, with the semen that gets shipped into our facility, so to speak. So. Um, you know, when they're making those stallion choices, sometimes, um, you know, the, fr the, the, the work done on the front end is just as important as the work done on the back end. Um, so, um, mare owners, I, 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 I kind of teach mare owners questions to ask because I'm dealing with a lot of frozen semen as well. So I ask, I have our clients ask about sperm numbers, post cell motility, first cycle conception rates. First cycle conception rates are very important in our, in our hands. Um, you know, ask those questions of the stallion manager or the stallion owner to give to give you some information to talk to your veterinarian about. If I have an owner that says, well, the stallion has a has a 30% per cycle conception rate, that's not all that great. If they come to me and say, well, he's got an 85% per cycle, first cycle conception rate, that makes me feel a lot better. So there are questions that owners can ask that can um, that can make them feel better about the product that they're that they're buying. And I think that that's important to kind of, it's not only a good um, relationship point to have with your clients, but it's also a practice builder. It allows you to, to form a relationship with the mare owner to say, hey, these are the things you need to be looking for so that you're not 
setting yourself up for a problem. Uh, Dr. Ferris, we have a question from our live audience. John wants to know how many foals can a mare have over her lifetime? That's a it's a it's an interesting question, um, and so there's multiple ways yeah. to answer that. So, um, you know, a lot of mares uh, coming off, depending if they have a performance career or not, but if they're truly just a brood mare, they could start having a full when they're three years of age, and then um, if with good management, good fertile stallions, and a good fertile mare, you could have a full every year well into when that mare is probably into her teens and usually once once a time once a mare like that would get into her her 15 16 17 years of age she'll probably start having some some reproductive issues that we would expect to see in in all mares um in which case at that point there um she might skip a year um from having a full um once or twice in that that period between 15 and 20 um but still very well could be carrying foals well well into her 20s now the, the caveat with it that would be for mares carrying their own their own foal. So it wouldn't be uncommon to have a mare produce 12 to 15 foals in her lifetime um, that she is she has herself carried. Now if we add in other technologies like embryo transfer, this allows us to potentially generate um, two, three, four, or, or five or, or even more pregnancies a year, and, and those pregnancies are being carried by surrogates. And so this would allow us to exponentially increase the number of foals that could be produced over the lifetime of that individual mare. And then with newer technologies like um, uh, ICSI, um, where we, we aspirate mares, collect their oocytes, perform in vitro fertilization, and, and generate multiple, multiple uh, embryos, um, we may even potentially be able to, to increase those numbers. So, some mares, um, there's some popular quarter horse and, and Arabian and warm blood mares um, out there that embryo transfer is allowed in. Uh, some of these mares may have 30, 40, 50 foals um, or more um, that can be generated in a lifetime. Um, we have another question from our live audience. It's from Becca in Nevada. And Dr. Schofield, she wants to know if a larger stallion like a Percheron can safely be bred to a mare like a light bone thoroughbred. Um, would carrying a foal by a larger stallion harm the mare? Uh, it certainly can. Um, you know, it, there's no good, and Ryan, you can you might have some, some backup that I don't have, but there's no good, there's no good, technology out there that allows you to say this is a bad idea. Um, in in cows, you can sometimes measure pelvic inlet. We don't really do size. We don't really do that in horses. But I get nervous when there's a, a, a large mismatch in the size of the stallion versus the mare. Um, we see this in warm bloods with people breeding for sport ponies, um, trying to do it not not breeding to a pony stallion, but using a pony mare with a warm blood stallion. It's, it's, it's a little problematic. And... Uh, and so if there's a large discrepancy in the size of um, stallion to the mare, I get a little nervous. And so in those situations, like the, you know, the sport ponies are very popular, is going the other direction safer than having uh, a larger mare maybe bred to a pony stallion? A hundred percent. Yes. Yes, ma'am. That would be the, in my hands, that's the, that's the way to do it. Um, now, if you wanted to go the other way, if you wanted to breed your, I mean, this is all theoretical. I'm not, I'm not advocating anything, but if you wanted to breed your 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 light horse mare to a, to a Percheron stud, you could do the breeding, and then, as Ryan mentioned, do embryo transfer, flush the embryo out of the out of the mare, and put it in a a larger framed warm blood mare or draft mare to carry the baby and, and have the have the fetus. I mean, my major concern for any mare carrying a baby is is the potential problems at parturition, and if anybody who's been through it, a dystocia is a extraordinarily traumatic event, not only for the owners, but also for the, the veterinarians and the, the staff that have been around those horses. It's, it's not a fun thing to, to be around. It's very stressful. Outcomes may or may not be good. So, you know, a little bit of caution on the front end could prevent a pretty miserable event on the back end. So, um, in my hands, it's, it's much safer to breed a warm blood mare to a, to a pony stallion. Um, that way you know you are on the right side of the equation. 
Um, we have a question for you, Dr. Ferris, from Elizabeth in the live audience. She wants to know if there's a way to sex the embryo or odds of getting, uh, or increase the odds of getting a filly versus a colt by examining uh, semen before insemination. Uh, what technologies are available for sexing foals? So there's, it's a, it's a great question. It gets a little complicated because there's been lots of things that have been done from a research standpoint. So theoretically, we have a lot of options available to us, but clinically, we're still pretty limited in our ability to, to pick the sex of, of our offspring. Um, unlike in the cattle industry where, where really you can decide whether you want a, a little bull calf or a little heifer calf and, and pretty much have that, that generated for you. So currently, um, uh, the best technology that we have is to, to generate an embryo, recover that embryo via embryo transfer like we talked earlier, and then we could take a, uh, a small biopsy or collect some of the cells from that embryo, send those cells off, and determine if this um, uh, embryo happens to be male or female. The, the best way to, to potentially pick up the sex of, of our um, uh, offspring would be through sexing semen, and that would be the best thing that can happen. It's, it's commercially available in um, uh, cattle. It's not commercially available at this time in the horse. And, and so, unfortunately, uh, from a research standpoint, pregnancies have been generated from, from sex semen, um, uh, both fresh, cooled, and frozen sex semen in the past. Um, but at this point here, we don't have it commercially available to generate sex semen for, for picking the sex of the offspring. Hopefully that technology will become available um, as, as technologies improve. Every year that technology gets us a little bit better. And so hopefully we'll see that entering the commercial market in the next few years. Uh, Dr. Schofield, our next question is from, or is for you. It's from Leah in our audience. And Leah wants to know when sending or receiving semen overseas, is it more typical to send more doses or straws per container, or would you receive the same two doses as you might receive from a frozen uh, collection in the United States? Well, we need to do a little bit, kind of depends a little bit when you say overseas. Um, the cost of shipping frozen semen from either the United States to Europe or Europe to the United States is, is, is significant. It's a significant cost. If we're talking about going just across the border to, say, Canada, then that's a little bit a different ballgame. But in our hands, shipping, um, shipping frozen semen to Canada is, is not ostensibly more expensive than shipping um, regular frozen semen. We would, if we're shipping to Canada, we'd ship um, two or three doses for a mare owner, but we usually kind of we try to convince our mare owners to get together with their friends and make one shipment with multiple steins in it to kind of sh to kind of split the cost of of shipping because it does the shipping is the more expensive part. When we're talking about going overseas, if you are interested in a stein, say from um, from Europe, uh, the cost of shipping two doses of frozen semen from Europe for one stein is probably cost prohibitive. That's probably more than the, the, co the cost of the semen itself. So um, there are options for people in the United States. There are, there are frozen semen brokers that, that import large quantities of frozen semen and then have it here in the United States and, and sell doses um, that allow access to stallions from overseas. Now, if you go that route, there are questions you need to ask. You need to ask about post op progressive motility and sperm numbers. Um, there is, um, there is just like anything that you buy, you're buying it, you're buying a commodity and, um, you know, you want to know that you're, what you're buying is quality and can get, generate pregnancies. So ask if pregnancies have been generated and ask how many sperm you're buying. Um, so I doubt that anybody, I know very few clients that have ever shipped semen overseas for one or two doses. Um, they're usually buying them in bulk. Um, from somebody who's shipped in more than one dose at a time. Does that answer uh, the question? I, yeah, yeah. Um, we have another question from Emily in our live audience, and I think this is one that you both can address. Let's start with Dr. Ferris. Emily wants to know if you have any tips for choosing a good stallion confirmationly that will um, help improve upon or complement your mare. Well, you know, I think it's a it's a great question. I get a lot of a lot of clients that ask about this, and and 
do a fair amount of reading of, of the research that's out there of going, boy, how much does the stallion improve conformation? And it really depends on the, on the specific trait that you're looking at, and it's heavy, heavily influenced by the breed as well. And so I think globally we can say that, unfortunately, um, if you're starting with a mare that has, has poor quality conformation, even if you breed to the best stallion in that, that particular breed, you're not going to make dramatic changes to your foals. Uh, confirmation. It'll take take several generations, many, many generations, to actually make uh, significant improvements in confirmation. So the couple studies that have been done out, out there looking at confirmation in, in horses, kind of their suggestion is that the mare seems to play a pretty significant role in this and that um, if you're really looking to dramatically improve confirmation, potentially improving your mare quality uh, may be the fastest way to do that in your particular herd. Dr. Schofield, Dr. Schofield do what do you what do you recommend? <laughs> I make it a practice point not to get in, involved in picking stallions. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I I I have the luxury of having clients usually have an idea of what they're looking to do with a, with a um, with a mare and, and what they're trying to do with her progeny. Um, when it comes to to picking stallions, I usually actually point them to other other breeders or other large farms that are, that that might have access to a lot of stallions that allows them to to kind of say hey we know that this stallion can improve x so we've seen this stallion have an influence on y um, in my hands I don't try to get involved in those decisions mostly because I don't want them coming back to me later and saying well he told me it was going to make my baby beautiful <laughs> and it's not um, I do, however, and Ryan, I know, has this too. We do have the fertile stallion list. So if you have a stallion, if you're not, you know, we all have the idea in our head that uh, of stallions that can help with reproductive problems, maybe not conformational problems, but with reproductive problems. There are stallions out there that are what I consider hyper fertile. Um, but when it comes to actual conformational issues, I try to stay out of that conversation, mostly um, for a, a professional point. If that's that might be passing the buck, but that's what I try to do. Okay. Um, we have a question that was one of our uh, initial registration questions that um, that goes back to mayor size, and it's talking about ponies again, Dr. Schofield. Um, this is from Allison in Prince Edward. Island, Canada, and she said that she has an impeccably pedigreed mare who is just 13 hands and much smaller than her siblings. Will she have small offspring herself? Um, that's a good question. I, I would, I, my gut instinct is that you know genetics are what they are. Um, that re, that that particular mare is short statured for a reason. Um, she now might have recessive traits that when turned on could make her have a very large baby, but my guess is that if you bred a smaller horse, you're going to have a smaller baby. Now, the caveat to this, and um, this, if she's significantly smaller than all of her siblings, and she has never been ultrasounded or checked before reproductively, I would, I would have a veterinarian out and make sure that she is reproductively sound. Um, some mares that have a genetic abnormality called Turner syndrome, where they're, they're actually missing an X chromosome, um, are short statured and smaller by nature, and they're missing ovaries. So, um, if that's a major concern, and she hasn't been reproductively evaluated, I would I would have somebody out to look at that mare. And if she is normal, which is probably she probably is normal, she's just small. My guess is that I that she will throw smaller babies, and I would take a smaller stallion. Um, we have a question from our live audience, uh, and it's from uh, Marie in Ireland, and she wants to know what can be done for mares at high risk for NI, and how long should the foal be kept away from the mare before being allowed to nurse again? Do you, uh, do either one of you want to tackle that question? Uh, sure, happy to. So, I, you know, I think if you have a, a you know, any mare that's had foals previously in their lives have a, a potential chance of, of being at risk for NI. And, and fortunately, um, there's some great uh, screening tests that can be done. So basically, just by simply collecting a serum sample from your mare, you can send that into a diagnostic lab. Um, here in the United States, there's, there's dozens of diagnostic labs that will perform this analysis and see if the mare has antibodies against other equine red blood cell types. And if she does, then potentially, um, uh, if bred to the stallion, if, if that foal happens to have the red blood cell type 
that the mare has antibodies against, the, the disease neonatal isoetherolysis or NI could develop. And so if we have mares in our clinical program that are, are, have antibodies against um, various red blood cell types, what we do is we muzzle the foal for the first 24 hours of life. And, and we, we strip the mare, we throw away her toxic colostrum, and we, give, give this, we supplement this foal with colostrum from other mares that we've banked in our colostrum bank um, uh, that are NI negative. And so this gives that foal those important antibodies to support it for the first couple months of life. And then after 24 hours of age, that mare has, has quit producing colostrum. You removed the colostrum by, by milking out the mare for that first 24 hours. And at that point there, the foal's GI tract has closed and is no longer able to absorb those antibodies. And so at that point there, it's safe to allow that foal to nurse from the mare again. There is a test that potentially could be done to screen of whether um, those antibodies would affect the, the foal. So you can compare the, the mare's serum versus the foal's red blood cells. And that test is called the jaundice foal agglutination test. Now, for us in our clinical program, um, with the value of some of our foals, we don't feel like it's, it's worth making a life or death decision on, on a disease that's very easily managed um, by just supplementing that foal with another mare's colostrum and holding it off um, from nursing from that mare for the first 24 hours of life. So we don't run that particular test in our clinical program, but it is something that is that is available potentially to use. Okay. Well, unfortunately, uh, that's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, the hour went by really fast, um, but we got some great questions from our live audience. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, super active audience tonight. I want to thank Dr. Ferris and Dr. Schofield for joining us. Uh, Dr. Ferris, Dr. Schofield. My pleasure to, to be here tonight and, and hope we're able to answer uh, many of your questions. Yes, thank you very much for your attention and, and best of luck this breeding season. It's, uh, it's coming down to crunch time. Yep. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone who submitted your questions ahead of time and everyone who listened live. Uh, you can join us next month when we discuss equine dental care. But until then, from all of us here at The Horse, have a great evening. <laughs>